Welcome to the Bakersfield City Council meeting. This television broadcast is brought to you by the local cable companies, the County of Kern, and the City of Bakersfield. You can watch the rebroadcast of this meeting Saturday at 7 p.m., Sunday at 10 a.m., and the following Wednesday at 7 p.m. You can download the agenda for this meeting at www.bakersfieldcity.us. Presiding over this evening's meeting, the Honorable Mayor Karen K. Go. Good evening. Welcome to the 530 City Council meeting of March 20th, 2019. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mayor Go. Here. Vice Mayor Parlier. Here. Councilmember Rivera. <coughs> Councilmember Gonzalez. Here. Councilmember Weir. Here. Councilmember Smith. I am here. Councilmember Freeman. Here. Councilmember Sullivan. Here. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. I think we have some roadrunners in the house. Is that correct? Welcome, uh, College uh, Bakersfield College Renegades. Thank you all for being here. How many do we have? No, we have a few. Oh, we have a lot of renegades. Okay, so Professor Holmes and Kim, they will be happy. And then we also are privileged, and I think they're coming in right now to have the young assembly members from Assemblyman Rudy Solis's office. And I see uh, Representative Athena Skapinakis leading them in. So welcome. We're very glad to have you here today. And thank you for engaging in the civic process. We now have the privilege of having Ms. Minister Albert Watkins of Compassion Christian lead us in the invocation. We appreciate Compassion Christian's involvement in our community, and I know in the summer you host many different educational programs for youth who are uh, going through challenges. Following the invocation, we will have Jonathan Parham, who is a senior at Frontier High School, to lead us in the pledge. Jonathan has a 3.96 GPA. He's captain of the varsity swim team. He plays trumpet for the Marching Titans and is the trumpet section leader for the jazz band. And he is on his way to West Point. So congratulations on that. Uh, we're looking forward. Make sure that you come back and uh, serve us. But uh, thank you for your willingness to go that route and serve our country. So at this time, would you all please stand while Minister Watkins leads us in the invocation. Thank you. Let us bow our heads. Lord, we just thank you for today, for protecting us and watching over us and keeping us safe all throughout the day. Lord, as we come together as a family, a community, and a city, Lord, we thank you for our mayor, Tonight, oh God, continue to give her insight and wisdom uh, to be able to do her job unto you, Lord. Father, we thank you for our city councilmen and women that are on uh, each, over each ward, oh Lord. Father, we thank you for unity between those city uh, uh, councilmen, oh God. And as we come together today, oh Lord, we just want to thank you for all the leaders in this city, oh God. We thank you for the growth that we've had over the years, oh Lord. We thank you that you give them insight, oh God, to uh, new constructions and new roads and uh, new buildings, oh God, and all the uh, amendments and presentations that will go forth tonight, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, that you lead us and guide us. Direct us, oh God. Order our paths, oh God. We know that Bakersfield is a great city, Lord, and we thank you for it, oh God. Father, we thank you for all the leaders that are here tonight, oh God, and as, as we come together on one accord, Lord, and uh, speak up for our city and our amendments, Lord, we just thank you that you be in the midst, Father, that everything will be done decently and orderly tonight, oh God. Father, we thank you for the young people, oh God, that are here, oh God, that are representing our city, that will go out and do great things great exports uh, in their lives, oh God. Father, we thank you right now, Father, as um, uh, we come to this meeting and we continue to give you praise and continue to give you honor for all that you're doing in our city, Lord. Father, we just thank you right now, Lord, and we thank you for the public statements that are going to go forth. We thank you for our universities 
CSUB, oh God, and Bakersfield College, oh God, and all the other universities that are represented here tonight, Lord, we thank you for them, oh God. Father, we just want to just give you honor that everything that we do tonight, oh God, will be pleasing in your sight, and that we do all our work unto you, Lord. We thank you right now. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Minister. Jonathan? Salute. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, and you may be seated. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Under presentations, we have a proclamation presented to the Gandhi Celebration Committee and the Naina and Ravi Patel Foundation declaring Peace and Nonviolence Day in Bakersfield on March 30th, 2019. We have an opportunity tonight to have four different presentations. So I am honored to have all of you here. Come on up, purple shirts. Gandhi has said, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. And I am so glad that we have a group here who wishes to be the change. And it's a group that cares about peace in this world where we have so much discord and turbulence. There's a group here who is choosing to highlight peace. And so it's my honor today to be able to present this proclamation. Whereas the Gandhi Celebration Committee and the Ravi and Naina Patel Foundation are commemorating Mahatma Gandhi's 150th birthday anniversary with a series of local celebrations, and whereas the Gandhi Celebration Committee and the Foundation have reserved March 30th as Festival of Peace and Nonviolence March at Don Hart Hart Park at CSUB, and whereas the Festival of Peace and Nonviolence March will promote Gandhi's philosophy of peace, truth, and nonviolence, and the positive effects it can have on the city, citizens of Bakersfield, and whereas it is important that all citizens know and understand the philosophy of truth, peace, and nonviolence and its positive effects and how it can improve discourse, interaction with each other and our community as a whole. And whereas the Gandhi Celebration Committee and the Foundation are providing a vital public service to our community. Now, therefore, I, Karen Go, Mayor of the City of Bakersfield, do hereby proclaim March 30th, 2019 as peace and Nonviolence Day in our city and call upon all citizens and all patriotic civic and community organizations to observe this day with appropriate ceremonies and observances in which the residents of Bakersfield and Kern County may join in recognizing and celebrating peace, truth, and nonviolence. And it's my honor to be able to present this today. And accepting today will be from the foundation would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, go. I'm Amar Patel. Thank you, Mayor thank Go, you so and thank you to the Bakersfield City Council for the proclamation of March 30th as uh, the day of peace and nonviolence. I'm proud to announce the first annual festival and march for peace of nonviolence on that day, Saturday, March 30th at 9.30 a.m. Uh, on behalf of the Gandhi Celebration Committee. Um, We'll have an event that day which will include a march, live music, um, food trucks, as well as a speech by Aisha Mason. As w additionally, we will, the event will include all ages, so feel free to bring the whole family. And um, you can get more information by visiting our website at facebook.com slash tribute to Gandhi. Thank you so much and hope to see you all there. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, next item, please. A proclamation to Chad Provenzal, Assistant Principal um, of the Kern High School District's Bakersfield Adult School, declaring Adult Education Week in Bakersfield during the week of April 8, 2019. Welcome. Good to see you. Where would we be without adult education? It's always a thrill for me when I get to visit on campus to see eager adults really wanting to be in school. Sometimes it's a little different from kids who don't really want to be there. Adults, they want to be there, and uh, you can see uh, how much all of you pour into their lives. And so it is always my joy to be able to celebrate this day. There are nearly 36 million adults in the U.S. struggling with their basic academic skills, and it makes it so difficult for them to function. But uh, we're making a difference here in Bakersfield. So it is my honor to be able to present this proclamation. Whereas the state of California will observe Adult Education Week, April 8th through April 12th, and the Kern High School District, along with the Board of Trustees, acknowledges that the Bakersfield Adult School serves the changing economic and cultural needs of a vigorous expanding community. And whereas the Bakersfield Adult School prepares over ready for this, 10,000 10, students to meet academic, personal, and professional goals by enrolling in one or more of the diploma, GED, second as English as a second language business and health career programs. And whereas the Bakersfield Adult School prepares adults to successfully complete the process to become new US citizens. And whereas in 2018, 281 adults received high school diplomas, 71 adults earned GEDs, 13 adults graduated from the two-year vocational nurse program, and 30, over 3,300 adults at Bakersfield Adult School and the Lairdo Detention Facility completed one or more career technical education programs. And whereas the Bakersfield Adult School provides programs especially designed for older adults and the disabled population, and whereas the Bakersfield Adult School provides for the unique needs of individuals in a diverse population. Now, therefore, I, Karen Go, Mayor of the City of Bakersfield, do hereby recognize Adult Education Week in our city and salute the administration, teachers, and students of the Bakersfield Adult School and honor each one of them for their efforts and accomplishments. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. And the mic is all yours. Thank you. On behalf of the Kern High School District and the Bakersfield Adult School, we'd like to thank, thank the uh, City Council. And in particular, uh, we'd also like to thank Mayor Goh, who's I know she's, like, like her predecessor, has, set, has placed a lot of importance on adult education. Mayor Goh's even, you know, came out and sat on her advisory boards and really um, put her time in, not just her words, to adult education. So we'd just like to thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Right. Good afternoon. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Proclamation to Mike and Plummer, member of the Board of Directors for the Boys and Girls Club of Kern County, declaring National Boys and Girls Club Week in Bakersfield during the week of April 8, 2019. This is another one of my favorites, and I get to hang out at the Boys and Girls Club a lot. But imagine not having the Boys and Girls Club. I can't imagine not having the Boys and Girls Club in our community. Across America, the clubs serve nearly 4 million children annually, and here you serve a lot through your 45 clubs. So it is my honor to be able to present this proclamation. Whereas the young people of Bakersfield are tomorrow's leaders and many young people need professional youth services to guide them so they may reach their full potential. And whereas the 45 boys and girls clubs in Bakersfield provide services to almost 
5,000, 5,000 young people annually promoting academic success, healthy lifestyles, good character, and citizenship. And whereas boys and girls clubs in our city help to ensure that our young people are occupied by offering them a safe and supportive refuge, one that provides quality programs, and whereas the Boys and Girls Clubs in Bakersfield will celebrate National Boys and Girls Club Week in 2019 along with 4,000 clubs and more than 2 million young people nationwide. Now, therefore, I, Karen Go, Mayor of the City of Bakersfield, do hereby proclaim April 8th through April 12th 2019 as Boys and Girls Club Week in our city and call upon all of our citizens to join in recognizing and convening the Boys and Girls Club of Kern County for providing comprehensive and effective services to the young people of our community. It's my honor to be able to present this to you. Both of you come up. Ms. Plummer, thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Smith, and both of you feel free to come. Thank you, Mayor Go, and thank you to the City Council for this proclamation. Um, I'm Mike and Plummer. I am the Executive Director of the Kern County Builders Exchange, but today I'm a very proud member of the Board of Directors of the Boys and Girls Club of Bakersfield. And, um, you know, it's real easy for us to stand up here and say all the great things that the Boys and Girls Club does, but um, it makes a real impact when you see it for yourself. So during this eight to, or April 8th through 12th, we would love to have an open door invitation at your convenience for you guys to see for yourselves the impact that Zane Smith and his staff have on the children of the Boys and Girls Club. I mean, it's, it's absolutely remarkable when you get to see it in person, so we hope that you will join us. And a fourth celebration, Madam Clerk. A proclamation to Ross and Cindy Hugie of the American Red Cross Central California region declaring Red Cross Month in Bakersfield during March 2019. There they are. Come on up. You know, Cindy, oftentimes when I see you, you are just getting on a plane to go to a disaster. Correct. It never ends. And then I see you again, and you're about to take off for another one. <laughs> and imagine the 244 families locally if they hadn't had your help. We are so grateful to have the Red Cross. We're so grateful for your commitment, your dedication to serve under the most difficult circumstances. And so it is my honor today to be able to present this proclamation. Whereas the American Red Cross was established in 1881 as a humanitarian organization guided by seven fundamental principles, including humanity, impartiality, and independence to provide services to those in need. And whereas today the American Red Cross is one of the largest humanitarian organizations in the world and delivers its mission every day, every day to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies. And whereas every year the American Red Cross responds to an average of more than 62,000 disasters across our country, from small home fires to devastating massive disasters. And whereas the Kern County chapter assisted with 244 local families during times of disaster in the past year alone and helped save lives through the Home Fire Campaign, which launched in October 2014 and has since worked with community partners to install over 6,000 smoke alarms, making over 2,300 households safer. And whereas Red Cross volunteers and donors give their time and resources to members of the community by, deli by delivering help, but not only help, hope 
during a disaster. And whereas the American Red Cross shelters, feeds, and provides emotional support to victims of disasters, supplies approximately 40% of the nation's blood, teaches skills that save lives, provides international humanitarian aid, and supports military members and their families. Now, therefore, I, Karen Go, Mayor of the City of Bakersfield, do hereby proclaim March 2019 as Red Cross Month in our city and encourage all residents to support the American Red Cross mission to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies. Thank you, Cindy and team, so much for your dedication to those who are facing the greatest challenges. I'd like to thank Mayor Go and the Consul for this wonderful proclamation. As a volunteer, it's my privilege to be able to serve my city and beyond. Uh, with me today, I have Carolyn, our board member, Megan as our disaster program director who runs everything here locally, and Mark Smith is a volunteer and AmeriCorps uh, member. I can't tell you the hours that they put in along with myself and other volunteers. It is a privilege. We do go out at 1, 2 in the morning. In fact, we had a team out last night serving a family that had a fire. About approximately three families a week locally in the city of Bakersfield are served by the Red Cross. It is our privilege to be able to help those in need, and we will continue to do so. Thank you very much. And you heard that word, volunteer. That's what they do. <laughs> Madam Clerk, next item, please. Public statements. At this time, we'll receive public statements. All statements are given a three-minute time limit, 15 minutes per topic. If you have written comments that are longer than your verbal statement, please give those to the clerk, and she'll give copies to the council. Please avoid any behavior that disrupts the meeting. We're very interested and concerned with your issues. Due to the public notice requirements of the Brown Act, Council can't take action when an item isn't on the agenda. The Council can, however, refer your matter to committee or request that staff contact you. So now may we, stall, may we have the first public speaker, please, Madam Clerk. America, we've received two uh, public speaker cards, both on separate subjects. The first public, public speaker of the evening is Michael Turnipseed regarding Measure N. Welcome, Mr. Turnipseed. You are becoming a regular attendee with a regular chair. Madam Mayor, it's nice to be here. When you Thank sign you. up for duty, though, you have to be here to watch what goes on. I'm Michael Turnipseed. I represent the Kern County Taxpayers Association. And because of your stringent three-minute time limits, I have to put more and more stuff in writing. I'm learning that, by the way. Uh, we supported Measure N because we requested four things. Two of them have been completed. The committee's been com appointed, and when the nom it's been nominated, we got to nominate somebody who got appointed. Now, hearings are going on, items are being discussed. Here's the list, like the money's already been spent. Uh, I haven't heard from the council yet on goals and objectives, but I understand you're gonna take that up next month, which is a good thing, because the goals and objectives of the city are set by you, the council and what's best for your wards. And we can never forget that. It is the people that are paying the taxes that are expect to seeing measurable outcomes from the spending of this money. <clears throat> talk is talk. Action is action. So I want to make sure tonight I've given you, and I want to make sure, because I haven't heard if the public's going to get to present or not projects, so I'm giving you the short version of some of the things we'd like to see addressed. Lighting in the darkest neighborhoods. 
we figure there are thousands and thousands of street lights that don't exist, yet there's money being proposed to be spent to replace existing lights. We think it's more important to put lights in where there are no lights. And there's another thing about an urban trail, more walking opportunities, a lot of things that are on that are in my written comments there. But I'm here tonight because I won't be able, I'll be in Sacramento next week at the Caltax annual meeting. And we're glad to hear that you're gonna be discussing goals and objectives in April. And I just wanna remind you that one of the most important things in your goals and objectives is adopting measurable outcomes for every dollar you spend. We know the inputs, that's the $58 million you're gonna get from the taxpayers. We're seeing a list of the outputs, you're hiring people, you're buying equipment, you're putting money in regional parks. Don't forget the local parks. Just because you're having a cleanup, go around and be on call to clean them up. That's not investing in equipment and toys and water facilities and everything that local parks need in this town. They're in desperate need. We want to see measurable results. And I know in working you with your outcomes and your, your goals and output, goals and uh, objectives for the new budget, we will see many of those outcomes take place. Thank you very much. 19 seconds left. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Jervis. By the way, thank you for your resolution opposing the severance tax. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next speaker, please. The final speaker this evening is Belen Delgado regarding Martin Luther King's celebration. Welcome, Mr. Delgado. Good afternoon. <laughs> Um, my name is Belen Delgado, and I'm here with the Dol Dolores Huerta Foundation uh, Youth and Family Civic Engagement Program. Um, but I'm also here as a student from West High. Um, in January, the nation honored Do Dr. Martin Luther King in various ways. On April 4th, we recognized the day Dr. King was murdered. I am here as a member of the, not only the foundation, but also as uh, youth in the community to ask the city of Bakersfield to establish a Martin Luther King Unity community, uh, Committee. Sorry, The city of Fresno sponsors and oversees the Martin Luther King Unity Committee that organizes an annual three-day celebration that has been open to the public for the last 35 years. The celebration starts with a march with hundreds of people and students of all backgrounds and ends with a singing, dancing, and art celebration at the Fresno Memorial Auditorium. We would like to see the city of Bakersfield organize a similar celebration here in Bakersfield to honor the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We would be happy to sit on the committee and provide suggestions for our celebration here in the city of Bakersfield. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Delgado. Councilmember Gonzalez, are you trying to? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Ms. Delgado, for your comments. If I can ask staff to reach out to Ms. Delgado about her ideas and see if we can coordinate with the existing Dr. King committees in the community and how that might um, complement the efforts that currently are underway. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Consent calendar items 8A through 8T for approval. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Does any council member wish to recuse themselves from an item? Does any council member wish to remove a consent item for separate consideration? <coughs> Seeing none, I make a motion to approve consent calendar items 8A through 8T, as in Tom, along with the noted agenda correction by the city clerk. Thank you. You have a motion. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved with Councilmember Rivera absent. Thank you. And notice, our technology worked. Last time, actually, we had a little glitch. But as it turns out, it was not an internal fault. It was a system-wide failure. So good job. Thank you, tech team. And now, next item, please.
under hearings, uh, Mayor, I just want to announce that we've received a memorandum regarding item 10A, transmitting corrected pages of the master fee schedule. Thank you. Our next item is the public hearing. Before I open the public hearing, I'll go over the presentation time policy. Each side will be allowed 15 minutes. It's 15 minutes for all speakers, so it's important that you identify yourself, make your statement quickly so others may speak. We'll hear statements from those opposed to staff's recommendation. Then we'll hear from those who would like to speak in favor of staff's recommendation. If there's testimony on both sides, each side will be allowed a five-minute rebuttal. There's a clock on the two TV screens behind me which indicates 15 minutes. Please step to the microphone, identify yourself. After 14 minutes, a yellow light will come on, and at the end of 15 minutes, a red light will flash, indicating your time is up, and at that point, please end your statements quickly. You may ask questions during your statement, but they won't be answered until the public hearing is closed. If you have written comments that are longer than your verbal statements, please give those to the clerk, and she'll provide copies to the council. Please be courteous to others who wish to speak. Unless there is approval by the majority of the City Council, there's a strict 15-minute time limit for all those in favor or in opposition to staff's recommendation. So please be concise, avoid repeating the remarks of the previous speakers. Madam Clerk, would you please read the public hearing item? Public hearing to consider resolution adopting fees pursuant to the cost recovery system. Thank you. Mr. Smith? Thank you, Mary Go, members of the council, Nelson Smith, finance director. The state law requires the city hold a public hearing any time that we're considering either raising fees or adding new fees to the fee schedule. Uh, the municipal code requires that staff complete a full review of the fees and charges every two years and bring those uh, findings and information to the council uh, for your review. The last full review of the fees uh, was completed June 2017. Each city department completes a full review of their fees and they recommend either increases or decreases uh, to realign their fees with the actual cost of providing the service. Most of the fees are minor, uh, most of the fee changes are minor in nature uh, and in line with inflation of roughly 3% a year. There are 12 fees which are highlighted in the administrative report that fall outside of the general inflation category. I'd like to specifically address a couple of those. The first is the DUI towing charge, which is a D71 in the schedule. Review of this fee identified uh, an additional two hours of officer's time that was not previously included in the fee. So the police department is proposing to increase the fee by $114, taking the fee from $170 to $284 to recover the staff time involved in this process. The memo that you received uh, this evening identifies a clerical error that was made on the schedule that's in the agenda packet where the $114 increase was accidentally input on the line above the DOI towing charge. The corrected sheet, which is page 16 of the schedule, is attached to the memo you have. The other item is the recreational center rentals for Martin Luther King, Silver Creek, Saunders, and Millhouse. The Parks Department is recommending that all of the fees for rental of these facilities be raised for nonprofit groups up to the amount that are currently being charged for the private use groups. The proposed increases range from one to $29. The department believes this change will not only be easier to administer, but it may generate some additional revenue and will be more legally defensible. The private use rental rates are not proposed to change. Again, due to a clerical oversight, the schedule in the agenda packet did not accurately reflect the proposed changes and the pages attached to your memo, which are pages 18 and 19 of the fee schedule, are the corrected version of the fee for this category. Thank you, Mr. Smith. At this time, I'll open the public hearing. How many people would like to speak in opposition to staff's recommendation? May I see your hands? Seeing none. How many people would like to speak in support of staff's recommendation? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing and return it to council for comment and action.
Motion to adopt resolution. We have a motion. Please cast your votes. Motion is approved with Councilmember Rivera absent. Thank you. Next item, please. Under reports, we have fiscal year 2018 2019 mid year budget review. Thank you. Mr. Smith again. Thank you, Mary Go. Uh, Nelson Smith, Finance Director, uh, thank you for your patience. I'll be providing a mid-year budget review for the general fund. When I said mid-year, I, mean real, I really mean uh, at, a, at a current point in time. So this actually, these numbers actually run through the end of February. So we're about two-thirds of the way through the fiscal year. This first page shows some of our uh, larger revenue sources. And the, the first the column on the left shows the, the revenue definition. The first set of numbers show the, the fiscal year budget or rev estimated revenues. The next column is the actual revenues collected to date, which is about uh, two thirds of the way through the year. And then the next column is the percent of budget collected. And then there's some, some notes at the bottom that are referenced. So as you can see, the first line, current secured property taxes, we've collected about 56% of revenue. On the surface, that would appear to be a little bit under, but the way our tax revenues come in, it's right on target. We get some money in December, some more money in April, and, and so being less than 67% is not, it's not a problem in this situation. Uh, on sales taxes, again, the 57% uh, appears to be less than two-thirds of the way through, but uh, sales tax revenues lag in collections throughout the fiscal year, and they actually get made up after June 30th. Uh, so the, the money is run about two months behind. So again, we're, we're actually a little bit ahead of schedule and, and the revenues are projecting above budget estimates. Then you look at the business license line, you know, 96%, that looks like a great number, but most of our business license revenues comes in during July and August. And so we don't expect a lot, of, a lot more money to come in this fiscal year. So again, we're pretty much online. Here we have uh, some other revenue streams, intergovernmental revenues, a uh, little bit ahead of 67%. Uh, charges for services uh, are pretty close to um, target. And finance, fines and assessments are right on, right on target and miscellaneous revenues are a little bit above estimates. On the expenditure side, uh, now we have departmental uh, names on the left-hand side. The first column again is the annual budget for that department. The next column are the actual cost to date. Again, we're two-thirds of the way through the year. Uh, we have outstanding encumbrances, which are uh, purchase orders and contracts that are under, under contract but have not been, uh, finished being paid yet. And then the remaining balance. So on the right-hand side, the percent of budget remaining, we're looking for some we're numbers 33% or above, that, that would be a positive outcome. And as you can see, uh, the mayor's budget, legal services, city clerk, and executive branch, finance, we're all above 33% remaining budget. So we all have, we're all gonna have a little bit of savings left over probably. Here we have police and fire. Again, we're looking for a target that's at least 33% or above and both of those are in line with, with our budget estimates. Public Works, Parks and Recreation, again, uh, both are above the, uh, the target of, uh, at, this, at this point of the fiscal year. And Planning and Building and Economic Development. Uh, uh, planning and Building are uh, above estimates. Economic Development, their, their budget is um, project driven and they've, uh, so it's not necessarily a linear process throughout the year, so they've, their expenses appear to be higher, but it's only because they've completed a, a larger percentage of the project uh, at this point in the fiscal year. 
So overall, uh, everything looks fine at this point. Uh, there's no areas of concern either on the revenue or the expense side. And I'd like to turn it over to Chris Hewitt now. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, City Council Members, Chris Hewitt, City Manager's Office. Uh, so following Mr. Smith's presentations, there are two uh, minor adjustments we would like to propose to you this evening uh, based upon some uh, organizational changes that we've seen and are anticipating. Uh, so with that, I will start first in the Public Works Department. The proposal before you and one of the items we're asking your approval for this evening is the addition of two construction inspector positions. These are fee-supported positions that review various components of development, so whether that's utilities, tracks, parcel maps, street permit, traffic control plans, uh, they're really a, a crucial part of, of that process. And as I will show you in just a minute, we're experiencing some delays in inspection times above and beyond our, our objectives that the, the department sets for itself. Uh, and so therefore, some of these delays in, in getting inspections done are delaying, unfortunately, residential and commercial uh, projects. So right now, we have four inspectors that do this work regularly for the entire city. Uh, and, and that was compared, just for comparison purposes, I think prior to the, the downturn, uh, there were 10 that were uh, responsible for this type of work throughout the city. So with the economy and development showing some stability for some t uh, time now, uh, we've seen those inspection times creep up and the demand uh, increase. So as I talked about, we've seen about actually a 60% increase in monthly inspections, just raw numbers, since June of 2017. The goal is to get out and do an inspection on average 48 hours after the request is made. We're seeing times that can take up to 14 days today. The developers do have an option to use on-call inspectors, meaning uh, the city has contracted with engineering firms that do this type of work on an on-call basis. It does mean that the developers are paying uh, for that enhanced service, so to speak. Uh, but with this proposal, uh, Mr. Fiddler and his crew believe uh, the addition of two inspectors at this point in time is prudent and will uh, significantly reduce the uh, time that it takes currently to do those inspections. The second package of adjustments is in the Human Resources Division. The proposal this evening is to add one supervisor and one analyst position. We've seen a, a significant percentage increase in the number of recruitments over the past three years, close to 60 percent, uh, and, and then just again the raw number. We are anticipating both uh, through uh, Measure N as well as our normal attrition rate uh, to see the number of improvements continue to, to remain at the pace that they're at and then increase uh, likely after July 1st. Uh, and of course, the recruitment process for public agencies is a little bit more complex and a little bit more involved in the, in the, public se in the, in the private sector. Uh, so the work that our analysts and our supervisors and our HR staff is doing uh, is, has increased over the last, again, several years. So we're looking to onboard uh, these two positions uh, in the current fiscal year. The intent is, and you'll see uh, later uh, in, in the process for the measure, that these positions are proposed to be a part of the, the service, uh, support services group uh, for the measure. So these positions, we would add them in the general fund this year is what's being proposed and make that transition uh, next year to support largely uh, the hiring that will be uh, done and anticipated under the measure. So there are several items that the, the staff is asking the council to consider and approve this evening related to, to these items. Uh, it is the appropriation of funds uh, for the positions. Uh, again, the inspector positions are fee supported. Again, the revenues that are paid for those services uh, will we'll we'll, uh, support those positions. And then we are asking for uh, a nominal amount of general fund balance for the remainder of the fiscal year for the two HR positions, again, with the intent to transfer those uh, to the measure after July 1. So with that, uh, I'm available for questions. If you had questions about the earlier component of the presentation, Mr. Smith and others are here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hewitt. Colleagues, any comments? Councilmember Freeman. Thank you for the 
I guess I need this going. Um, if I could just expand a little bit, this relates a little bit to what Mr. Termit Seed was, uh, was requesting was, um, if when you make the request for additional funds and personnel, which we'll be doing a lot of with Measure N, if you can, along these lines, and I think you could do even more, um, describe what the outcome will be. Part of what he's getting at, you know, if we add um, two people to personnel, it ought to go on to allow us to meet these recruitment goals of 40 police, 25 this year, something that explains this is what we will do with the money in a concrete way because that sort of completes the loop on our understanding the results that Mr. Termsky is asking about. Well, you know, what, if we grant you this, what will you do? What will change? What will get better? And a lot of this is just presentation and sort of finishing the discussion, closing the loop on it. Um, so you did a pretty good job on this. I think we could do even better by finishing. If, you know, if we hire two new inspectors, we will eliminate 100% of delays or 50% of delays, just something a little more concrete that we will know after we make the expenditure, this new investment, what will be the result, what will we get? And if you can apply that through all of these measure N requests, if we, you know, if we hire 43 police officers, um, I don't know what the outputs are, but you might say, you know, burglaries will be reduced by 10% or homicides will go down or response times will be down by this something that shows the result so we can better understand, aha, okay, we make this investment and this is what we will get out of it. And as you move through, you measure in proposals and budget proposals. If you'd sort of add that thought, it will make it easier for the council, I think easier for the measure in committee to say, you know, we're gonna invest three million in the convention center to rehab all these things and it will result in five more events or something that shows this is what the result will be. Councilman Freeman, Thank we uh, have a return on investment uh, section of uh, the public safety and vital services measure uh, proposals which do exactly that. Okay. Um, it is the last section of that inch and a half thick document uh, that you were sent out about a week and a half ago. Uh, we will be going over it in conjunction with the budget issues in future months. Good. My, uh, my comments really apply to everything we request, but I, I believe that's what Mr. Turnipseed was getting at, was the request that we show concretely what the result of the new expenditures will be so everybody can understand um, this is what we get for the money, and that's what the public was expecting. And it just compl it's almost just completing your thought. So thank you. Council Member Smith. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to thank staff <coughs> on the uh, construction inspectors. A 48-hour goal is great. 14 days is not good at all. And, and we had just talked a week or so ago to the Planning Development Committee how, you know, we, we want to be business friendly. We want to provide services in order to keep business moving as fast as they can. And, and this is one of the ways. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Council Member Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. Well, a similar comment as Councilmember Smith. I wanted to thank staff for <clears throat> taking this action. My question was, um, so before the economic downturn, we had 10 inspectors, and that was reduced to four, which is where we are currently. We will add two. The goal is 48 hours. Will we be able to meet that goal? How confident are we with the additional two inspectors that we will, in fact, meet that goal? I will defer to... Uh, Nick Fiddler for more information on that. Honorable Mayor, Council Member Gonzalez, um, we are proposing two for this current fiscal year to, mm -hmm. to meet that demand. We are going to continue to analyze the, um, the amount of workload and see if we need to add a third as well. We also are able to use on-call consultants for some of the work as well to keep up with demand. But we're seeing an influx of not only development but also for uh, street permits like uh, Mr. Hewat has mentioned uh, through the small cell activity, mm -hmm. for instance, Verizon Wireless is putting almost 200 miles of conduit in the ground through various locations throughout the city. So we've tried to utilize some uh, consultants to help manage that workload. Um, but yeah, our goal is to meet that 48-hour uh, response time with our own staff, and as we need to, we'll bring on the consultants. 
and then we see that we're continually using the consultants, then we will come back and request an additional staff member as we evaluate it moving forward. Okay, great. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to thank you, staff, to City Manager's Office for bringing on extra HR personnel. You know, we talk about hiring 100 new police officers, but we're not going to get one police officer on the street unless we get them through the very arduous process and all post requirements, and that can't be done without HR. So thanks again. Colleagues, anyone else? Make a motion to accept the mid-year report, approval of the four new positions, and appropriation transfer of funds. You have a motion. Please cast your votes. Still nothing. <laughs> Motion is approved with Council Member Rivera absent. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Next item, please. Also under reports, fiscal year 2018-19 Bakersfield Public Safety and Vital Services Measure proposed allocations. Mr. Hon Candy. Honorable Mayor and members of City Council, you have five recommendations before you this evening as articulated on the agenda. Uh, three of them are appropriating monies for the initial phases that we see as being necessary to prepare <coughs> for this measure's enactment. Uh, and then uh, two of them relate to waiving normal bidding requirements and certain contract documents to initiate getting the uh, new police training center retrofitted, uh, hopefully in time for the academy, no, I, I'll retract that, in time for the academy, which begins this August. Um, the budget this year uh, is unique and different. Uh, so let me talk about that for a minute. Normally on the first meeting in May, you get an overview of the total budget from the city manager's office, and uh, then you spend the next two months uh, in a variety of sessions with multiple items on your regular agenda and a couple of special meetings uh, to go over the budget. That will all take place again this year, but what has been added is the new steps relative uh, to uh, the public safety and vital services measure and us going before uh, the Oversight Committee. We've had two, two sessions with the Oversight Committee. Uh, we have two more scheduled, uh, and uh, we will then take uh, the product of the proposals uh, on the measure and merge them with the regular budget proposals and present you with the budget package, which consists of both of those aggregated, but they'll be severable. So in essence, you'll be able to peel back a page and look only at measure N. When you wish to do that, you'll see them combined so that they're within the context of the overall uh, when you wish to do that. Uh, so I, I promise it will not be as boring and dry as the last several years when we stand up and say we don't have enough money and we're not doing anything other than with grants and so on. Uh, in fact, we will be doing uh, a great deal. Uh, the measure uh, goes into effect to the taxpayer uh, on April 1st of 2019. Uh, and uh, the initial implementation uh, consists of one quarter sales tax allocation, which under our accounting system is credited to the 1819 year. And then, of course, four quarters for the first full year in 1920. Uh, we talked mostly during the measures uh, outreach program about $50 million. Uh, since that was set over a year, year and a half ago, the trend in the sales tax receipts has gone up, and the legislature actually did something positive and closed one leap, loophole on, uh, that allowed for uh, people to escape uh, taxation in certain instances. 
And so the new uh, uh, projection for a full fiscal year is $58 billion. Uh, there were 13 uh, priorities uh, that were identified in the ballot measure, and all of the N major N uh, priorities are supposed to correspond to one or more of those. Uh, we will talk about them next. Uh, and again, uh, all of this will be new and innovative and different and a much bolder approach to addressing some serious issues in the community than we have been able to do in the recent past. Uh, the 13 uh, priorities uh, uh, articulated in the ballot measure, uh, seven of them are actually police related. Um, in, improve response times, reduce crimes, increase neighborhood police patrols, uh, in, improved response to assaults and burglaries, maintaining and proven rapid response to gang violence, investigating and proactively preventing property crimes, burglaries, and vehicle thefts, p p keeping public areas safe and clean, strengthening capacity of the special enforcement unit, and expanding the school officer program. Then we have the other uh, programs, uh, which include maintaining a fully staffed and equipped class two rated fire department, Reducing homelessness, and of course, uh, new information was revealed within the last few days uh, on the homeless count, which is up for, was 46% up last year, 50% up this year from the higher number. Um, probably a representation that in the previous years there was undercounting, uh, but certainly a problem which continues to grow. And we have some uh, bold actions to recommend to you uh, to take to assist in dealing with that problem. Addressing the fiscal stability of the city, creating jobs through economic development, business retention, attraction, and workforce development, enhancing amenities throughout the community to improve the quality of life and attract visitors, and enhancing neighborhoods, traditional code enforcement, and improved park maintenance. The uh, <coughs> materials being presented to the oversight committee list one or more of these in advance of articulating the expense category uh, because one of the tasks of that committee uh, in accordance with the ballot was to validate or certify that the proposed expenditures were in accordance with the ballot measure prioritization. <clears throat> to give you the context of the overall on a preliminary basis so that you see how that relates to the three spending proposals uh, that are being recommended early uh, the overall plan uh, will uh, result or proposes to result in the hiring of 126 new positions, 43 sworn in the police department and 25 civilian with a three-year plan to have 100 sworn added to the department and a corresponding uh, necessary number of civilians, 11 fire department positions in the first year followed by I believe 12 the second year. Uh, Creation of two rapid response teams, uh, one to deal with parks, litter, debris, uh, the constant problem we have with uh, people tearing up the parks, the, the toilets, the grass, uh, playground equipment, burning things. It is a, a daily problem uh, and we're proposing a rapid response team. What happens now is that the regular parks crews that work in Ward 6 or Ward 2 are pulled off their regular duties in order to address these issues. They're almost constant, so we have disruption to the schedules. The rapid response team will run seven days a week. It will address these issues and allow those crews to continue their regular work uh, within the districts. Uh, it is modeled, both of these proposals are modeled after our graffiti abatement program, which was developed several years ago. Uh, and which has been remarkably effective in reducing how long graffiti is out there uh, by running seven days a week with uh, advanced quality equipment, uh, having it on the city app so people can take a photo and send in a geocoded uh, complaint uh, and we respond directly. Uh, homelessness is the second one and uh, Every one of you uh, gives me homelessness, debris, litter, shopping cart uh, complaints, uh, sometimes in uh, the, f the fronts of businesses, sometimes in our parks, sometimes in our sumps, uh, all over really. And uh, 
we do uh, big gear ups and getting a multi departmental function to do periodic large scale cleanups. Uh, we're going to go here, if this is approved eventually by the council, to a seven day a week, again uh, on a city app. Um, you, you send in the photo if the camp is abandoned, we clean it up there and there. Uh, if it's a circumstance that requires notice and an option for that uh, homeless person to get their belongings stored, we'll at least post it and so that in the minimum time required by law, we return to do the cleanup. And we think this will have the potential to shorten the duration of these uh, unsightly uh, and uh, uncomfortable, unbusinesslike, un unresidential uh, enjoyment of property like circumstances that we have all over town. Uh, economic development, uh, since redevelopment was taken away, we haven't had a functional program. Uh, we are proposing that we get back into that and recreate the capability of doing urban renewal programs. Um, have a database and a staff that advocates on behalf of the city, uh, solicits and responds to inquiries from businesses in advocacy of building our tax base, uh, and uh, activating and funding the uh, economic op opportunity zones that were created by the city council uh, some years ago in seven specific areas but which have been in suspension due to lack of funding. So we're going to propose $100,000 in each district as seed money. Uh, and uh, we believe that it can help cover costs such as permits or fees or uh, other things that might be kind of the borderline between holding a business development back or not. And at least will be a start in the recreation of a program uh, that was once Oh, in the area of $17 million a year. Uh, it'll take a while to get back to that level. Homelessness, uh, two major allocations for adding beds for housing. These are over and above the 40 beds for the women and 40 beds for the men uh, in the mission and homeless shelter as done by previous council action. These would all be beds over and above that. The first is a concept for bridge housing, which is for the people who are not currently allowed into the present shelters. Uh, if you have a dog, if you have a spouse, um, if you're uh, on drugs or alcohol, you're not currently allowed in. Therefore, they're permanently outside and the source of annoyance. Uh, this is a uh, low barrier shelter concept. We are following models around the state closely uh, to get best practices. Uh, and those people would be allowed in. There would be treatment uh, capability, social workers, hopefully um, people with medical and or de chemical dependency skills there to offer services uh, to these folks. So the rapid response team will be cleaning up the debris and litter. Uh, they will give information out to people about this as an alternate. Some will follow it, some will not, but the hope is that by having available beds and available services over time and with patience and substantial investment, uh, we can get some people out of this circumstance that is currently um, predominating uh, around the community. We also have $5 million for a longer term housing project, um, which could be a Bakersfield homeless shelter uh, replacement expansion, we would certainly solicit from others proposals before finalizing the exact details of such a decision. And there's $450,000 for contractual services, which would assist the goal of getting uh, some of the homeless off the streets and into a more productive lifestyle. We would solicit proposals from private sector experts and service providers, uh, and then bring back to council those proposals with uh, the appropriate contracts. We have a number of energy efficiency uh, proposals uh, following the model of converting 13,000 street lights, which was done this last year, which reduces the frequency of having outages and changing the bulbs, which reduces consumption of energy and which increases lighting. Uh, we will have some major programs proposed at the convention center arena 
and in some of the lighting areas around the city that were not covered by the 13,000 already converted. And we have a number of event and facility up upgrades and enhancements, including enhancements to the, the regional sports complexes. Uh, regional sports complexes, I would argue, add a quality of life issue. Uh, they add family entertainment. They add uh, youth-related healthful activities. Uh, and uh, they form a model for what Bakersfield is, which is a family-friendly community. They also secondarily serve an economic development purpose by bringing in tournaments uh, and activities from all over the western United States. The expansion of them will allow for increased enhancement of that. Uh, the two proposed allocations for the five quarters of the two fiscal years, 14 and a half and 56 million five hundred thousand dollars for a total of just under 71 million dollars we have left about one and a half million dollars unallocated uh, for future discussion or future action and consideration <coughs> the combined allocations uh, for the five quarters uh, you can see that police was the largest priority of constituents during the uh, passage of the ballot measure, uh, and they are scheduled to get the largest proportion of the money, uh, followed closely by parks and recreation, homelessness, and fiscal stability. And then you can see on this chart uh, that all of the priorities are being addressed in some form. Uh, those that are capital intensive uh, tend to get larger allocations. Over time, uh, the, as the police staffing and fire staffing grows in the two or three year planning period, there will be more money going into the staffing and ongoing costs and somewhat less available for capital allocations. So we're hoping in these early years to make as much progress on needed capital allocations as possible. And then this is a chart by only the proposed 1920 allocations and uh, you can see there that police is in for 36 percent development services which is combined homelessness and uh, economic developments 26 percent parks and rec 22 uh, and so on by the way uh, the total I promised during the outreach campaign that the total amount going to CalPERS in the first year would be under 13 percent. It is 6 percent. Assistant City Manager Chris Hewatt is going to talk about some of the specifics of the first three allocations. Uh, good evening once again, Honorable Mayor and Council, Chris Hewatt, City Manager's Office. Uh, so what I'm going to walk you through this evening is uh, regarding the action items that are on your agenda for consideration. Uh, what, what Mr. Tandy went over was a snapshot of the entire program uh, for the five quarters as proposed currently uh, and as being reviewed currently uh, by the, the Citizens Oversight Committee. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is kind of the foundational aspects of the, the programs we're looking to kickstart come July 1 when the new fiscal year starts uh, and how we roll those services and programs out quickly and efficiently come July 1. And the way we do that uh, is to allocate new revenue in the current year that will be received in the current year uh, to purchase things such as vehicles, and to upgrade certain facilities, again, to be prepared when July 1st comes uh, to start providing those services, or in, in a case that will show you uh, have a facility that is ready to go uh, to start to uh, accept and train new police officers as part of the three-year program. We're also going to talk to you a little bit about a one-time opportunity to take advantage of uh, a methodology to actually reduce uh, retirement costs and again that uh, decision to do that must be made prior to July 1 or well in advance of July 1 so staff has time uh, to prepare for that. 
So I'm just going to go over a few things in detail. You've seen this once already. Uh, what I'm going to be talking to you tonight again about is this $14.5 million uh, that the city anticipates in new revenue through the measure in the current fiscal year. So that is again the three area, the three allocations uh, tie back to, to that, uh, that amount in this fiscal year. So to break the three allocations that staff is proposing down, uh, $900,000 uh, to begin the retrofit of an existing city-owned building uh, for a standalone police academy and training facility, looking to acquire several pieces of equipment early for various departments. So again, come July 1, the vehicles and that equipment will be ready to go once the positions are filled and there's no lag time that would otherwise exist if we had to start procuring vehicles after July 1st. And then again, that fiscal stability item, as we've talked about, to essentially eliminate interest payments, increase general fund reserves, uh, and, and ultimately reduce cost uh, to the retirement system. The chart to your right is a breakdown uh, by percentage of uh, where this money would be allocated. So again, about 83% is going to that one-time opportunity. 6% uh, to the facility for the police department and then the early acquisitions uh, make uh, vehicles make up about 11%. I'm going to get into the three allocations in slightly more detail. As we talked about, the measure spending priorities really drive every one of these proposals that's before you. So this first one is the allocation for the police department academy and advanced training facility in the amount of $900,000. And as we talked about earlier, that meets about seven of the measure spending priorities, big picture, uh, to be able to train and, and then provide ongoing and continual training uh, to uh, sworn officers. So uh, the city is now the owner of uh, this building uh, that you may recognize at 4646 California through a process of, uh, that we went through with the Thomas Rose Improvement Program and the Centennial Corridor Right-of-Way Acquisition Program. Uh, the city became owner of this facility. And e evaluating uh, opportunities uh, for the land and for the improvements, uh, the concept of retrofitting it and rehabbing it to make it an academy and advanced training facility for the police department came to mind. And after further evaluation by uh, several departments uh, with the lead of the police department, we feel this facility is uh, optimal for this type of use. The city currently does not have its own uh, training facility. The chief can speak a little bit more about feedback from post uh, and what other cities are doing uh, as far as training facilities. But in essence, uh, the hiring that we're expecting to do under this program in the next several years, as well as uh, the normal attrition in the department for sworn officers really exceeds capacity that we have. Uh, in some of the shared academies and, and facilities that we've been using otherwise for many years. On top of that, right now, for advanced training ongoing uh, throughout the year, in a lot of cases, we're sending staff uh, to other cities uh, at the cost of hotels and meals and travel. Uh, and this facility would be able to house several advanced training ongoing courses throughout the year. Uh, that again would, would save uh, dollars uh, and, and we would be able to reallocate those dollars elsewhere in the, in the department and in the organization. We uh, do, uh, the reason why we're asking for the accelerated process for this facility and starting the remodel is because we're anticipating that academy that would include uh, the 43 sworn positions previously uh, shown uh, will start in August. And so time is of the essence to uh, essentially take what you see on that bottom picture, uh, which is a nice themed restaurant, uh, to a post-certified police academy, uh, which will take some time and some effort. And we do believe we, we can do it uh, in, in the time frame that we need to do it. Uh, but it, it will take uh, essentially a green light soon to, to get that process started. The second item uh, that I'm talking to you about tonight is what we're calling the acceleration of the community priorities. So Mr. Tandy touched upon several uh, items uh, regarding the rapid response teams, regarding some increases to the fire department staffing that you'll, you'll get uh, more information on as we move forward in this process. All of those positions uh, require equipment. Some of it's specialized. Some of it's a little more uh, pickup trucks and, and the like that can be acquired a little bit quicker. Uh, but regardless, 
Uh, all that would take um, months or more to get acquired if we wait till July 1st, meaning if we hired uh, individuals in, in, say, August, uh, we would not have probably the equipment available for them at that time, so we'd have filled positions, uh, but, but no means to really deploy them in a meaningful way. Uh, in this case, what we're asking for is an allocation and an, an appropriation to begin the purchase of those vehicles. So again, they're ready right after July 1. Those positions are filled, they hit the streets. The amount that we're estimating necessary for this is about $1.58 million. And again, it all ties back to several of these priorities uh, that we've outlined uh, for you. A little bit more detail. Uh, the proposal for this item is about 20 vehicles. You can see how they're broken down there uh, by department. So the police department, uh, the impact unit, which deals with a lot of quality of life issues, homelessness, uh, looking to acquire a couple different pickup trucks, animal control, calls for service continue to increase on the animal control side of things. Uh, this would allow, again, those animal control officers that are part of this proposal to, again, hit the, hit the ground running after July 1. I won't go through every one of these departments. Uh, if you do have questions, we can, we can walk through them. But essentially, each piece of equipment here has been reviewed in detail by the departments in relationship to the priorities and the staffing that we're looking to, to add uh, to enhance services to the community. And we feel that this investment here uh, is, is a worthy one now to, again, be able to move forward uh, immediately to show the enhanced levels of service come July 1. There's a small little footnote in the bottom left-hand corner in the screen. Uh, we're still getting used to the new screens here, so I didn't mean to make it that small. Uh, but what it does say is essentially that uh, there's some contingency built into the budgets that will be coming before you for fiscal year 1920 under the measure uh, that include uh, equivalent costs for this equipment. So, for instance, if there is not approval of, of this item, uh, this one item, uh, staff is, is prepared to purchase those vehicles starting July 1, essentially, uh, if, if the early acquisition in this allocation is, is not available to staff. So the final item is the, the larger dollar amount. Out of the three, it's $12 million. Uh, and this is an item that uh, has several different positive components to it. It really is meant to address the, the fiscal stability of the city. Uh, and I will talk to you a little bit more in detail about this. It, this action will save the taxpayers an estimated $8.7 million over a seven-year period. And it all has to do with the way and the methodology in which the city pays its uh, retirement costs. It also increases reserves for the city, which are currently below levels that are recommended by uh, the GFOA, the Government Finance Officers Association, uh, and, and Mr. Smith has provided some information that's included in your packet, which goes into uh, a lot more detail on uh, current standards nationwide and where we're at and, uh, and where we need to really be. But this would be a one-time infusion of cash into reserves, uh, which would allow the city to change the method in which it pays uh, CalPERS on, its an on the annual basis for the unfunded liability portion of its payments, meaning right now we're paying monthly we're incurring, because we do not have the cash on hand at the beginning of the fiscal year, so we're incurring a 7% interest charge. Uh, if we went to a monthly payment, or we went to a yearly payment, excuse me, an upfront lump sum payment, which we could do uh, if, if, the, if the dollars were there, we would save, I think in the current year, a little over $800,000 at stair steps, and then again, over that seven year period, totals $8.7 million. It's important to note that this, again, is a one-time infusion, meaning that uh, the, the money is paid up front uh, throughout the year. The reserve is replenished, and it's available again the next year for uh, that upfront payment. It does need to occur. This action and staff must have direction prior to July 1, essentially to prepare to, do, uh, to select this option. It does also help in bond ratings, uh, should, should that be necessary in the future, and it will also uh, allow staff, or allow the city, excuse me, to have more cash on hand in, in case of an unanticipated event. Wrapping up, the city, the Citizens Oversight Committee has met twice to review uh, the 1819 allocations that are before you this, this evening, and they've started to review the detail of the 1920 allocations. We've provided you a snapshot. They're digging into the, uh, 
the weeds, so to speak, right now. Uh, their next meeting is next Monday evening. Uh, during their last meeting, a majority of the committee found that all three of the 2018-19 allocation proposals that I just talked about are consistent with those priorities outlined in the measure and uh, took action to confirm that. Again, as I mentioned, they will have some upcoming meetings to continue to review the proposals in detail for the next fiscal year. So the next steps, uh, staff is asking for, for several different actions tonight. Uh, first and foremost, approval of the three allocations uh, to begin to address uh, some of these items immediately. Uh, requesting waivers of normal bid requirements uh, due to the timing related to the academy facility work. There's also a, an agreement with a contractor for your consideration uh, that would allow for that work of the design and demolition that's necessary to begin immediately. And then as uh, Mr. Taney mentioned, we're going to be bringing back the, the full package and suite of proposals to you for fiscal year 1920 uh, upon conclusion of the review by the Citizens Oversight Committee. So with that, that ends uh, my comments. I'm available for questions as are uh, Mr. Smith, Mr. Tandy, and others. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hewatt. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chris, if you can come on back here for a sec. And I'm going to kind of work my way backwards from where you ended and go to the beginning of the presentation. There was a little bit of confusion in the community when it was first rolled out or came out in a paper, <clears throat> excuse me, regarding uh, prepaying some PERS costs on that. And, so if I put the analogy out there that uh, if you have a home loan, you have a 30-year mortgage on the house, and you make your payments early and you reduce your interest rate uh, by doing that, we're basically going to do the same thing, correct? It's essentially like paying off your, your credit card before the interest charges come due, essentially. Yeah. Very good. Um, with the low barrier facility, uh, I talked to the city manager about this too. I'm in favor of it. Uh, but one thing that I would ask that we have some sort of emphasis on transportation. Uh, if we, you know, help the collaborative somehow with vans or trailers. I know when homeless are out in my area and they're seven miles from the nearest resources, it's just impossible for them to get down there. And even if we make contact uh, via code enforcement or flood ministries, just getting them to the resources that they need uh, can be very arduous. Um, police jobs, uh, been some conversation about that. I would ask that, and I just checked before I came into the council meeting, that the post website, that uh, police jobs are posted on that, uh, also in PORAC magazine and CNOA magazine, which are both law enforcement publications, that we have something in those too. And the last item, uh, the police academy training facility. You know, at some point when this is up and running, uh, maybe we can look at it for other opportunities too. Is a regional training facility for law enforcement, uh, possibly for HIDA or CNOA training. Uh, I think that, or other statewide training, I think that could add uh, gravitas to our city and the police department. And I thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Any other questions? Councilmember Freeman. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Hewitt, um, have you done even a quick and dirty analysis of the, um, the economic benefit, the call it return on investment of the 900000 You've not talked about a lot of savings. It seems to me that this one would have been a perfect example of saying, hey, we're going to spend 900000 and we're going to save this much money every year, not sending people all over the countryside for training and housing and food. Um, this, this is an example of the type of thing in the future I would like to see. But have you got any ballpark idea on what you might save from, I mean, 900000 is not a lot of money. But I wondered, you save 90000 a year? Uh, Councilmember Freeman, we can't deliver the hires. Uh, yeah, the 43 sworn uh, and the, those uh, who, who leave through attrition without the facility. I can tell you that we examined uh, other uh, leased or purchased facilities around town uh, looking for the specific criteria uh, that meets post requirements. 
We thought we'd landed on one. Um, we it took a couple of months to negotiate the the lease, and during the couple of months of negotiations, uh, there was seven hundred thousand uh, dollars in damages done to the structure by the the homeless. Uh, that wasn't our loss uh, because we hadn't executed the lease, uh, but there was a comparative effort made. Chief, you would have to address, uh, I know that you are planning on regional training and other issues like that uh, if you have a ballpark number on the, the savings. Madam Mayor, Councilmember Freeman, um, we send several hundred officers <clears throat> out of town every year for training, depending upon what type of training, those types of things. When you're looking at the 43 new positions plus the attrition, those folks are also going to have to be trained because other people will move up within the organization. So there's specialized training that's required by post, whether you're a sergeant, so you have to go to supervisor school. If you're, you move into management, you have to go to management school. All of those types of things are costs that we have to incur. I don't have the exact figures for that. But going to uh, Councilmember Parlier's point, um, over the last six to eight years, um, California Post has recommended that we have our own facility as a regional training facility. The Sheriff's Department typically in their facility is just for academies. But when uh, this facility is up and running, we'll be able to what we call host um, trainings. So folks from anywhere in the state can come to our facility, get training, depending upon how many bodies are in that training, then our training becomes free. So we get free seats in, in the actual training and someone else basically ends up paying for it. So this is a win-win, uh, a if you will, but to put the actual dollar amount to it, I'd have to go back and look at all the numbers over the last, to give you a, what you'd be looking for over the last five years so I could kind of give you a true trend or, okay. or analysis. Oh, if that's I'm what not really about. arguing that it's not a good idea. No, no. I, I think you might find you have an incredible return on investment. That's why I think it'd be worth going back. You don't have to have this next week, but I think for your own benefit, you might go back and say, well, well what's the real potential here? Because I think it'll turn out to be quite a good investment. Uh, my other question is, you know, when we do things quickly, and try to put together a budget. Somebody came up with 900,000. I, I don't know if that really, I can't believe it's fully bid out because we usually miss our budgets. I mean, my background's construction and seldom when we have to put a budget together very quickly, you know, we usually go over the budget. So, um, I mean, if we did, we did. At this point, it's probably a little too late, but uh, I hope this won't look like a, uh, is this the old El Torito or something? I mean, I hope it won't look, I hope it's going to look like a professional police academy when we're done. And uh, if that took an extra 50000 that's okay with me. Uh, I don't think it ought to look like an old Mexican restaurant. It needs to look professional. And we, if we're going to do it, let's do a first-rate training facility that we're all proud of. So. Uh, okay. We will get there. Uh, that's a little bit out of my wheelhouse. I'll leave that to uh, Mr. Fiddler. I won't ask him to investigate burglaries, and he's not going to ask me to do construction. Okay, Mr. <laughs> Fiddler, then. This is going to look like a professional police academy. Uh, 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 Council Member um, Freeman, we are going to do a, a significant amount of uh, work within the area to convert it as much as possible. Uh, we are stuck with the structure itself, so it, it is what it is. We're not going to go out there and uh, remodel the whole facade of that facility, but we will do our best efforts to make sure it meets all the needs of the post-training uh, standards and also be a first-class facility for them to work out of. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other colleagues? There you are. Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to thank staff for all the hard work. I know that my colleagues and I really appreciate it. Um, and I just want to also uh, commend you for your commitment to the spending priorities that were outlined uh, to the voters when, when uh, we proposed Measure N. Um, there have been many comments in the community about um, what we might do with N dollars, but in fact, uh, we are maintaining our commitment. Just wanted to highlight some of those thoughts. You know, folks in the community um, claim that all these dollars were going to go to CalPERS, uh, but in fact, um, 
in this proposed budget, only 6% of those dollars will go towards that. They said that no money was going to go to police, but in fact, 30% of the budget is going to police. They said that we were using homelessness as a way to campaign for N, but in fact, we're investing $11 million in homelessness. Um, and I mean, those items are significant, and it will add uh, immediate benefits to the community. And so I appreciate staff's commitment and their hard work throughout the last few months. And God bless you over the next few months further, um, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Councilmember Smith. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, staff. I just uh, want to reiterate what Councilmember Gonzalez mentioned. Is <coughs> it's exciting times, and, and uh, we're, we're able to move forward on what we know have been problems for s quite some time and not been able to deal with, and, and now we're able to deal with them substantially. And, and it takes a while to gear up, and it takes a while to really uh, address things, but it is very exciting to, to be able to do it. So thank you, and thank the community. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Make a motion to accept staff recommendation, including the pre-allocations and a waiver of the bidding requirement. You have a motion. Please cast your votes. Motion is approved with Council Member Rivera absent. Thank you. Next item, please. Council and Mayor Statements. I don't see any from my colleagues. Mr. Tandy spoke considerably about homelessness, and homelessness is the paramount issue facing California cities. He mentioned the 50% increase in homelessness. Uh, we want to thank the community for coming out to help us count. It was reported, I think, 49% increase, but I think it was really a math mistake. It's 100%. We doubled the number of people who were able to go out there and count. And counting our homeless persons is very, very important. Today, I was able to go to Sacramento to meet with Governor Newsom along with the mayors of the 11 largest cities in California. And we were able to advocate again for funding. We, we talked about the critical nature of homelessness in all our, in all our communities and advocated for, ongoing, for additional funding. Last year, we had $500 million set aside for the 11 largest cities. From what the governor said, I believe it's going to, he, he certainly took interest in the comments we had and he left with a comment saying, I'm going to make some adjustments based upon what was said today. We talked about prevention funding and the need for that also, in addition to what we're already doing, but be able to provide preventative services, maybe not having people who already have housing in, in housing wherever, uh, not be able to continue paying their rent, and oftentimes they become homeless for that reason. Uh, also, we talked about CEQA and the impact on housing and the need for CEQA reform so that we can get low-income housing up there quickly. We talked about mental health and the implications of uh, some of the changes that have gone on in past years and the desperate need for us to make sure that uh, the mental health, uh, persons of afflicted with mental health or battling mental health, uh, that we're able to be able to get them services even when they don't understand that they need services and that services can be helpful. I was very, very encouraged, uh, as were the other mayors, and we look forward to that. And thank you so much for uh, our community's investment in homelessness. We are our brother's keeper and we are doing something about it. It impacts not only homeless persons, but the quality of life. And so I am optimistic now that the quality of life for all of our community because of our efforts and the efforts uh, statewide will be improved. So thank you all for being here. Uh, students, you hung in there, BC, 
CSUB, thank you very much. And for all of you engaging in the civic process, thank you so much. We are adjourned at 6.52.